Good. Thanks for having me. Hey everybody, um, my name is Don Solomon. I'm an assistant professor of EMT at uh, Cooper University Hospital in Camden. Um, I want to thank Brett Comer and Sarah Lynn for putting this together. Um, appreciate the opportunity and hopefully we can keep a little education going, some sort semblance of normal while uh, this pandemic plays out and the curve flattens and we can all get back to the new normal. Um, so I'm going to talk today about pediatric airway foreign bodies. Um, as a pediatric ENT, this is a, a topic uh, near and dear to my heart, unless it occurs in the middle of the night. It creates a little bit of anxiety and gets us up out of bed. Um, but it's something that we should all be well versed in because um, not only is there a morbidity associated with pediatric airway foreign bodies, but there's also a mortality associated with it, unfortunately. Um, and so it's one of those issues that most of the things you're going to see in this lecture are junior resident level uh, things, right up until it's not. You can quickly advance into senior level resident issues and attending issues when things get hairy in the operating room. Um, so just a little bit of background. It's a slide over there. All right, so who ingests a farm body? Uh, the, the truth is everybody has the potential. Um, most of them occur in young children, um, younger than three years of age. That's more than 80% of these cases. Um, and the children that are highest at risk are uh, one and two year olds. They don't have the posterior molars that allow them to macerate food the way that you and I can. Um, they're starting to explore their environment and put things in their mouth. Um, they're easily distracted, as anyone who has kids knows. Uh, they laugh and get angry frequently. They inhale and don't have a necessarily coordinated uh, swallow. Uh, while they're being active, and the majority of these aspirations tend to be um, nuts, actually, though there are a variety of things that get aspirated, as you'll see as the lecture goes on. Um, one of the reasons that occurs is because the children can't master the nuts into the small pieces that you and I can, and then an inhalation at the wrong time, a laughter at the wrong time, a distraction at the wrong time, um, can move these farm bodies into the area. Um, even though 80% of these occur in younger children, there's still a significant number of older children that have aspiration events. In the video you're going to see in a little later in this lecture, uh, that's actually a 12-year-old who was um, playing with his sister, had an attack in his mouth while he was, uh, was talking was between his two teeth, and then she made him laugh, and he was held it, and it went down into his airway, and it was at 6 o'clock on Saturday night. Um, it was a witness aspiration. It was pretty clear, and so we had to take him to the operation. Uh, there's also an entity called Cafe Coronary, um, and that is the aspiration of a foreign body when they were out at a uh, restaurant or eating at home, and you have a large uh, food bolus in your mouth and that laughter or uh, an inhalation event occurs and the foreign body is aspirated. And this actually has a significant mortality associated with it because the trained um, provider who can do the Heimlich maneuver and or uh, an alternative technique to help uh, move the foreign body from the airway is not as available. And so you know, this is actually um, a significant cause of death even in the adult population. All right, so just a few facts, a few background facts. Um, foreign body, airway foreign body aspirations are the fourth leading cause of death in preschool age children. Um, generally, when um, these children get to the hospital, um, there is a much lower mortality associated with foreign body aspiration because most centers, at least in the United States, uh, are the dollars available or the transport for the million dollars um, this occurs more often in males, and that is thought to be the case because uh, male children tend to be a little more impulsive than female children and a little more reckless. So they're more likely to put things in their mouth and run around um, or be distracted. Um, 
and that's where it leads to potential aspiration. Um, there's a classic symptom trial that's described for foreign body aspiration. And this is something you should be thinking about in the uh, emergency room. Sorry, that's my kids' games on that. Um, so the classic symptom trial would be coughing, and it may be an intermittent cough, and that's uh, what I most often see, uh, rather than a persistent cough. It occurs every 30 seconds to 90 seconds. Wheezing, and you're going to see wheezing because most foreign bodies are not going to be stuck in the Lyrics or sublatus that are needed lower into the airway, so you can get some sort of easing with that. And decreased breath sounds, because most foreign bodies, they're the Mr. Broncos or an instant Broncos are going to decrease air movement in the affected lung field. Uh, some more facts the lipophilic aspirates, like peanuts, and we talked about peanuts being the majority. Uh, uh, Foreign body aspirates in younger children tend to lead to a uh, chemosis or inflammatory response over 24 hours. And that puts a little pressure on the provider to try and take the foreign body out sooner rather than later. Um, the longer the inflammatory process goes on, the more brittle the patient is from a respiratory standpoint, um, the harder they are to ventilate during the extraction of the foreign body. And the more mucosal inflammatory response you're going to see um, around the foreign body in the bronchus. Um, the veg vegetable matter foreign bodies tend not to lead to the same amount of chemosis, but um, they tend to break down quicker and lead to um, an infectious response. And so those are the ones where you're going to see some pus behind them uh, occurring over the period. 72 hours. Starch containing aspirates, um, bread, popcorn, um, can lead to a progressive obstruction as they become more saturated with fluids. Um, so, what starts out as a non um, emergent operative procedure can quickly advance, and the patient can be compensated um, as a starch form body that keeps them on. So as we mentioned, um, the, we mentioned the triad, uh, that will often be preceded by a witness aspiration event. So that is somebody else in the room with the child uh, who will notice uh, coughing or choking, either with eating, or when the child is just playing with something and puts it in the mouth. Um, but the witness aspiration event is not necessary to um, have a foreign body and it frequently doesn't occur. As you can imagine, young children will often be out of their parents' field of view, out of their parents' vision. Um, when these events occur, there may be some coughing or choking, and the may not be sure if there was an inspiration or something else was going on. Um, then if the triad of persistent cough and some distress occurs after, you may see the child in the ER with them. A great history for the body, but you have to be suspicious of it. Um, most of these children that you'll see in the ER will be coughing. Uh, intermittently. Some of them will have desaturation. And in my experience, the desaturation isn't um, significant unless it's a large and obstructive foreign body. So you might see a child that's usually 98, 99% of the room there, and all of a sudden they're hanging around 94, 95, 96. And it's, not, it's subtle, but it has to be, um, you have to be aware of that and be thinking about that because it's one of those clues that's going to suggest to you that you need to call your attending. Um, have them weigh in and decide if you would take the child to the um, If the foreign body is at the level of a larynx, you're going to have strider, or the subglottis, you're going to have strider. Um, if it's more distal, you're going to have uh, wheezing on the affected side. It's, uh, there's going to be high flow air flow, high flow uh, air reflux past the foreign body. Um, and if it's in the trachea, which is a little more rare because the trachea itself is, tends to be um, wider. It tends not to lodge foreign bodies. It usually has one of the broadest subbrotus where it moves distally. You can see both in inspiratory and expiratory release. It's in the trachea. Um, you're going to see diminished breath sounds on the affected side, as I mentioned. Um, and if you have a foreign body that's at the level of the larynx or the subbrotus, uh, you may also see contractions. Um, <clears throat> I recently had a child with a foreign body, um, multiple foreign bodies actually, it was 
at the level of the glottis and subglottis, um, and his presenting symptoms were not only um, cough and desaturation uh, and diminished breath sounds, but also significant um, expiratory, um, uh, significant expiratory uh, sounds and difficulty with full expiration. He was uh, air trapping because there was very little room for him to um, expire air around the form body. So the workup is going to be a chest x-ray um, and a neck x-ray if you suspect a laryngeal form body. Um, a CT scan can be valuable um, because if you have a stable child and an equivocal story where you're not sure if there's an aspiration event, the CT scan is often going to show you an obstruction in the um, main stem bronchus or the distal bronchus that's going to tip you over the edge towards the sense that this is something in the airway that you need to address straight away. Um, the minority of foreign bodies are actually regular takes, so you're not always going to see a foreign body on x-ray, um, but you will often uh, see some mucus or a foreign body on CT. Uh, IV access is necessary, so you're going to have to ready, um, ready the OR and make sure the patient has IV access because um, on occasion, the foreign body um, turns from an urgent issue into an emergent issue. You want to make sure that the patient is uh, ready to be rapidly as possible. So this um, slide depicts air trapping. Um, if you look at the right lung, this is a left uh, left bronchus foreign body. If you look at the right lung, you can see that in the inspiratory view, the, there's significant expansion. And on the expiratory view, uh, the lung collapses to a significant degree, whereas the uh, inspiratory view of the left lung, the lung does not collapse uh, as much on expiration. And, um, because the air is trapped and can't get out. All right, so as we ready for the, uh, let's, let's cut off a little bit. In any case, as we ready for the operating room, it's important to um, choose your weapons appropriately. Um, and this, there's a Chevalier Jackson um, truism, but this is one of those cases where if you spend a long time setting up, so two hour setup, leads to a two-minute case as opposed to a two-minute setup leading to a two-hour case. And when you have the child anesthetized on the operating table and you've taken over respirations, you don't want to be looking for equipment. So it's important to both know your equipment and have chosen it appropriately um, and put it together adequately to have tested your video screens and your lighting, make sure you have your D5 and your uh, if you discuss things with anesthesia, because when you're going in for a foreign body, uh, occasionally uh, these cases get hairy, and you want to make sure that you're uh, ready for any potentiality. So, um, what I like to do in general is use the Miller blade for anesthesia uh, to anesthetize the plain lidocaine. Um, <clears throat> the Plain lidocaine on the vocal cords and the subglottis allows me to easily uh, move through those spaces without creating coughing um, or movement in the patient. And from there, I like to move to a Parsons laryngoscope. The thing about Parsons that I like the best is its versatility. And this little upward lift um, that allows you to get in the molecula or even under the epiglottis and easily visualize the entire uh, vocal cords. Um, we also have a ventilation port here uh, that you can um, add high flow oxygen to or the hepatomerics in here and moving your bronchoscope in there. And you have really great lighting through the prism that slides in. You can also use the light bulb. Um, next, there's also the uh, lens home laryngoscope. The disadvantage to that is you don't have a side port to Remove the bronchoscope through, so you have to continue to work through that. Uh, you can the laryngoscope without removing it, same with the hollow and the pepper. Um, and there's these Yasafita and the anterior conosphere stroke, those are not something you generally want to use. One of the 
advantages of the Parsons Learning Scrub is that it has this open side porch so that you can remove it after you put an ET tube in without taking the hub off of the ET tube and pushing the ET tube through a closed scope. Um, you can also you can also look through um, the um, Parsons Learning Scope with the telescope to get an idea of what you're dealing with. And this is something that I may do um, in equivocal cases before I actually insert a bronchoscope. So I'll bring the larynx into view, and then I will, after I've anesthetized the cords, and then I'll go in with a telescope to see where the foreign body is and how I grow, which will allow me to plan my bronchoscopy. Um, so this is uh, the restored bronchoscope. This is the ventilating ports. And again, this is where the lecture is very much geared for junior residents. And then, as you'll see in the video, one of the foreign bodies we recently took out that's when it becomes a more senior level case and then a terminal level case. In any case, um, we have our bronchoscope, our prism, um, the diaphragm through which you can put a suction. You're going to want to make sure that your suction fits into the telescope and your optical pure set because frequently there's going to, there's going to be bleeding or trapped mucus or pus when there's an airway foreign body. So you want to make sure that you can work through the bronchoscope with your suction through your diaphragm. That's usually a five, six, or seven point suction. Um, and suction ahead of where your optical forceps are going to be very sweet. Um, and this is the uh, ventilation um, accordion that's going to attach, attach to your bronchoscope through which the anesthesia can maintain ventilation while you're in the airway bronchoscope. This is an optical forceps in through uh, a diaphragm so that you can to oxygen escape or air escape as you ventilate. Um, you have your suction in here, and you have your different uh, varieties of grasping forceps at the end of your optical forceps. <clears throat> this is video. This is a video of the OR and just putting the bronchoscopes together. Okay, so I have my suction devices. These I'm going to use when I'm going through with, the, <clears throat> with my Parsons laryngoscope. Um, and then I have my bronchoscope set up. I made this video for the nurses in our OR um, so that they could see how this works. I have a, a bronchoscope and a bridge device because we have an extra long telescope. This is probably a little slow compared to how the video is. I don't know if that has to do with the upload. Um, let's see if I can skip ahead a bit. Okay, so we have our this middle device goes here so that we can come through. We have our suction device set up and we have some optical forceps set up. These are optical forceps with diff different grasping heads, and we're going to go over the grasping heads in a second. Um, there's different grasping heads for different uh, foreign bodies. So there's coin grasper, there's an alligator grasper, there's peanut grasper. So I've got my Parsons laryngoscope set up. I have a Lindholm laryngoscope if I need it. Um, I think there's a point here where I'll show you that a 3.0 ET tube hub can connect onto the Parsons laryngoscope and the anesthesia can connect or shift it through that 3.0 hub. I have my defog and I have my lidocaine, so a plain lidocaine. Uh, your formula is going to be 4 milligrams per kilogram in every um, 1 cc. Uh, 1% clean lidocaine, there's 10 milligrams of lidocaine. So, based on that, you're going to do a calculation. And it's always fun to hit the junior residents with how much, um, how many cc's of lidocaine can the patient tolerate. And again, that's 4 milligrams per kilogram, and every cc of 1% clean lidocaine, there is 10 milligrams. I'm not sure if there's anything else of interest here. 
Yeah, so there's my 3 OET tube. Um, and the reason I get that out every time is because the hub on the 3 OET tube will connect to the ventilating hub on the ring of skirt, which will allow um, which will allow ventilation through the side port. And this is the ventilating port for a wind form, which actually fits into a slot on so let's get a little slower. Let's see if there's anything better here. This may be just me putting this together for the nurses. It's nice if you can train a single nursing team to learn to put this together for you so that um, it's ready at the beginning of your case, but it's often uh, the case that you don't have the usual nursing team, especially in the middle of the night. So both you, um, the junior resident, and the senior resident have to be well versed with how to put together a proper scope. Um, and here I'm just showing you the prism in the top. Um, I want to make sure that my suction goes through the diaphragm and fits through the side port. I want to make sure that my telescope fits in place using the articulating hub at the end of the vertical scope. Now I have a bronchoscope and bridge and telescope in place. Okay, so this is actually a coin grasping tool. So if you see that little tooth at the end, it actually hooks around the ledge that you'll find on a penny or a nickel or a quarter. Um, and as you're coming up through the vocal cords, that little grasping tooth allows you to pull through the restricted area without losing the without losing the phone body. That's not going to be a great instrument for a plastic foreign body because you want something with multiple teeth for that. This is that 3 OE T2 that I was talking about. Um, and then there's also going to be a peanut grasper, which we'll look at in a second. Um, <clears throat> that will allow you to get around the peanut without crushing it. Um, this is just Sorry about the speed of these videos, guys. This is really slow, really slow motion, but I think it has to be with just the videos. I don't actually know if it's slow. But you should be deliberate and not panic when you're doing this. Uh, though a little quicker than this, uh, deliberate and not panic is the way to move and take me All right, let's uh, move on to the next. Okay, so this is what I was talking about with regard to the peanut grasping forcep. Uh, this is the end of your optical forcep, so you're going to get the appropriate length telescope that fits in your optical forcep. And then beyond that, you're going to be able to see and look at the thing that you're grasping. The peanut grasping forcep, you can see, has this little curvature here, so it allows you to get around that um, nut without crushing it, um, theoretically. And this is an alligator forcep. This is good for plastic foreign bodies or metal foreign bodies like a tack or a screw. Um, this is actually a favorable foreign body because it has a lumen which allows the child to respirate without difficulty in the middle of the foreign body. Course. This is a coin grasping forcep. As I mentioned, you see this little tooth right at the end here. That allows you to get around the coin, and then we're going to meet resistance as you come up through the vocal cords and the subglass because it's tighter in that spot. And so that little tooth will often save you from dropping the foreign body um, back into the area. Um, I should note that if you can ventilate the patient, um, even if you drop the foreign body back into the area, you don't have to panic. Um, you need to communicate with anesthesia and be ready to go back in with your bronchoscope just to ventilate the patient and collect yourself and visualize things and make a new plan if you drop the foreign body and it's a lot of and ends up back in the um, A couple of years ago, I had a child with a peanut, and as I got the peanut up to the subglottis um, and pulled through the vocal cords, I didn't want to crush the peanut, so I wasn't squeezing it very hard. I uh, got up to the vocal cords, and the husk of the peanut actually came off, slipped off, and came out with the optical forcep and out of the airway. And the peanut itself fell back into the airway um, 
and then this ball valve up and down in the trachea foot. Uh, anesthesia set with ventilating time, there's no hurry. Uh, take your time, remove the husk completely from the operable forcep, and then we'll go back in in a second with the operable forcep. In that case, um, the child did just fine. We went in and grabbed the peanut and then when the husk was out, the peanut came out. So these are, I just wanted to illustrate that there's some tricks um, that you can use occasionally if you have a difficult to grasp foreign body. So there's occasions when you have um, a marble or a round foreign body that's occupying the entire bronchus, um, the instant bronchus or the distal bronchus, or it's occupying the uh, trachea in such a way that you can't get around it. And so some of the tricks, uh, either if it's occupying the cold bronchus and you can't get the grasping forceps around it because you're running into the mucosa and you don't want to be damaged, um, would be to pass an angioplasty balloon or a fully catheter uh, deflated past it, inflate it a little bit, and you can pull it up out of the distal bronchus or up into the trachea, um, and then get your grasping forceps around it without injuring the mucosa. Here is that um, plastic foreign body that uh, we saw in an earlier picture. I just wanted to illustrate with this that uh, this is very favorable. It's in the left main stem. Um, despite that, uh, you're going to have a lot of time to work and aim up your approach because you have a lumen here that allows you to um, allow the patient to breathe without difficulty. So you want to be careful around the corner because it's, as most of you know, it's very sensitive. And you can see this is uh, getting the alligator force up around that plastic foreign body. Um, this is one of the vegetable matter foreign bodies. This is actually a carrot. Um, and this is a basket to put uh, cup force up. I don't think that's a peanut grasping force up. Go in and get around that. And then you can see the petechia um, from the uh, damage of the instrumentation if you get your bronchus work right up against the um, main stem or if you're in a uh, distal bronchus, you're going to get uh, some edema that's going around that. You want to be aware that as you make multiple attempts, especially if you have multiple foreign bodies like this. Um, this is a foreign body completely blocked. It's a peanut completely blocking up the right main stem. And so you can see in these scenarios, sometimes you may have to consider sneaking an angioplasty balloon or a fully balloon past this to pull this up to a point where you can get your forcep in here and in here so that you don't injure the mucosa of the main stem bronchus or even the mucosa of the bronchus. This is a screw uh, just above the carina. Um, blocking off the right main stem, um, but it's in a favorable position because you have the narrow end of the screw and the point of the screw pointing at you. You can pull that into the bronchus and that was what I was trying to illustrate with this picture, that when you have a pin or a nail or a screw, you want to try and get the pointy end of this into the bronchus when you extract it so that you're not uh, scraping anything or at least doing as minimal damage to the mucosa as possible. And you'll see in this video, Coming up, um, what happens when you have a difficult to uh, aim up foreign body? And so, this is a uh, older child uh, that we talked about earlier had a um, foreign body in his left main stem bronchus um, because his sister made him laugh and he had a tag in his mouth. And so, there's a couple of key points to illustrate here. But there's a lot of videos, so take a little bit and you know, try and skip ahead to the end. So you see, there's the optical push-ups. I got my camera aimed upside down. I adjust that. There we go. The bronchoscope. Uh, what I should mention is when, you, when you're going in and out with the optical forcep, you want to have the bronchoscope positioned in a way that you can readily grab the foreign body. So um, you want to be able to ventilate the patient and stabilize the bronchoscope at the lip and gum so that you can go in and out with your optical forceps and you may have an assistant that uh, needs to help you with that. So this is a pin in the left main stem. All right, so you can see there's a little bleeding uh, or echinosis here, tachea here from the way the bronchoscope is setting up. 
the right main stem is over here. And now the tricky part for me, as you'll see, is trying to get this out with, by taking this safety pin and, I'm sorry, this uh, push pin and getting the sharp part of the tack into the lumen of the bronchoscope while the bronchoscope is in somewhat down towards the posterior wall because of the difficulty of position. We're feeling good when grasping, except that the way this is lodged down there, the way the bronchoscope is sitting, All right, this came out. Now, as we pull it out, we come down against the mucosa. And so you see that there'll be some difficulty trying to get this up into the, to the lumen of the bronchoscope. And it keeps wanting to let go because of the way the, uh, the forceps is grasping. Ventilation was fine the entire time, um, but the mucus in the blood there is making me a little anxious because I know I'm not ventilating the left one. So I'm going to have to go in with the suction, trying to improve my ventilation, my uh, visualization a little bit. So now I've got the tip of the pin, uh, the tip of the push pin into the bronchoscope, but I can't get my optical forceps in to grasp it exactly the way I want. Ventilation isn't a problem, so I have time to work. I think I'm going to go in and section a little bit. And there's the foreign body coming up. You can see the lingual tonsils. Um, and so the important point to illustrate at this point right now is um, that just because you remove a foreign body um, doesn't mean your procedure is complete. You want, to, um, you want to go back in and make sure there's no second foreign body. Um, and in this case, it was clean. Uh, there was no second foreign body. Um, just a second. In this case, it was clean. There was no second foreign body. Uh, this patient was about uh, weeks before. They were fine. Um, they were discharged the next day. I just kept them one night uh, because the pin had scraped along the mucosa to some degree. So I wanted to make sure that uh, the child did okay. Um, not very long ago, probably a little more than a year ago, I had a child, an 18-month-old, who took a couple broken pieces of his mother's suitcase um, and aspirated them. Um, I took out, and he was the one that was having a significant um, expiratory difficulty and uh, air trapping, um, and it was creating a significant water peak. Um, I removed the first foreign body and went back in to look for the second foreign body and get flash pulmonary edema. Um, I knew there was a second foreign body because I, had, uh, I had visualized it as I was removing the first piece. Um, he had flash pulmonary edema, and so we had to intubate him and um, get the pulmonary edema reversed, go back in to take a look. Uh, again, the pulmonary edema when you take him off the positive pressure uh, recurred. And so we actually had to leave him intubated overnight and come back the following day. Um, so it should be noted that if you are getting into difficulty and the child is at higher risk, um, from going back into a tent to remove the foreign body than he is from leaving, he or she is from leaving the foreign body in place. Uh, the better part of valor in that scenario is to come back another day. As long as the patient is stable enough with the foreign body in place that you're going to do less harm by leaving it and allowing it to the swelling in the pulmonary All right, getting close to the end here. Just some curls to think about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Airway foreign bodies have a higher predilection for right main stem bronchus, giving us a little wider um, than the vertical 
fragmented, so um, it's not always the case, but uh, the foreign bodies tend to be in the right mass and more often we're in the right fiscal jump as we often say. Um, early retrieval pretends a better outcome in most cases. Uh, if you've had somebody that has a foreign body um, suspected for weeks and weeks and they have a uh, Pneumonia, it makes sense to treat them with antibiotics. I do have to take them in the other night. In fact, without your um, best uh, nursing and ancillary staff team in place, taking them in the other night might make them more risk. But if you have somebody with a fresh foreign body in the airway, uh, unlike in the esophagus, the, um, the teaching would be to take them at the time that you can, rather than to let either a lipophilic pneumonia progress or chemosis progress or allow a new develop around a vegetative foreign body, which is going to make the airway strong, uh, plus an airway which is going to make the treatment more um, When you are on the fence about whether a foreign body uh, is present, um, the story is critical, you can see it on x-ray, um, there's some coughing, uh, maybe increased breath sounds, and may or may not have air traffic. Um, it's better to scope it out when you get out. Most of us can be very safe uh, by microscopy. And children tend to do better the earlier we get these one bodies out. So um, I'd suggest that uh, you're probably better area on the side of caution than you can use. Um, this final point on this slide it just refers to that um, peanut husk that uh, fell off of the glottis. When you have a ball valve in the knee and you can do adequate ventilation of the fine body in place, you have time. Uh, to set up, you know, reset up your instrumentation and get yourself in a place where you can safely remove the farm body. So important not to panic. You don't need to slow it in the first video, but you don't want to don't want to panic because uh, you want to act deliberately so that the fewest amount of attempts to remove the farm body. Um, so this goes into what I was saying previously a little bit, a difficult to retrieve foreign body, uh, or if you're unable to retrieve the foreign body, you can always advance it into the, uh, one of the main stem bronchus to allow ventilation of the opposite lung if you have to come back and either plan another move with another bronchoscopy at that time, or to plan another move the following day. Um, and this same tenant uh, would, would be would hold true when talking about transferring a patient to another institution where they will have more capability to remove the foreign body either because they have um, a cardiothoracic surgeon on hand if necessary to open the chest or if they have ECMO capabilities if you feel like you know, there's a high risk of losing the airway completely. Um, so that's something to keep in mind because uh, most children can be fine ventilating this one alone. Um, it's not ideal, but it will uh, take a body time and save a life. Um, okay. Okay. All right, I hope you enjoyed this heart to heart talk. Um, did my best, cross my heart. And, uh, hope I nailed it. All right, guys, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Um, and I appreciate everyone's attention. Dr. Solomon, thank you for that talk. Very, very uh, engaging. And uh, I like your jokes at the end. So we'll, we'll wait here for a few moments, see if anybody has any questions on. Um, I see two questions up. So it says, do you try to scope a child with a suspected foreign body aspiration at bedside prior to going to the OR? Um, so. It depends on the situation. If I suspect that the foreign body as, is at the level of the larynx or immediate subglottis, or if I ex suspect that it's in the hypopharynx or pharynx, and I feel like the child is stable, or I feel like my resident uh, has the skill level to perform the procedure, um, I, I will do a flexible scope at the bedside on occasion. Um, that being said, any time that I feel like the situation could be made worse, um, and if I know that I'm going to be going to the operating room, um, I think that often you don't gain much by doing a flex laryngoscopy at the bedside. And so if there is any doubt about um, uh, whether 
whether we're going to the operating room, that may help me. But I try not to put the child in a situation where I'm going to take a hypopharyngeal foreign body and turn it into a laryngeal aglotic foreign body. During laryngoscopy, um, bronchoscopy, is the child paralyzed or you prefer sedation with spontaneous respiration? Personally, I prefer uh, sedation with spontaneous respiration, and I've had good luck with our anesthesiologist at our institution where they've been able to um, induce with uh, mask anesthetic gas and titrate propofol with, so that the child can breathe spontaneously um, with the bronchoscope in place. But that's a somewhat of a delicate balance, and so you have to be confident in your anesthesia team, and they have to be comfortable doing that. So you need to make sure that you get adequate anesthesia of your hypopharynx, glottis, and subglottis, because um, if you have inadequate anesthesia in those areas, and you're sticking your scope in and out, and you don't have a paralyzed patient, you have uh, potential for buffing and injury of the trachea or the uh, larynx against those rigid scopes. Um, and there's no um, to ventilate with a bronchoscope on a par paralyzed patient should not be a problem if you have an adequately sized bronchoscope and you've sealed all of your uh, efflux um, routes on your bronchoscope. So you have your prism in place, you have your diaphragm, one for your suction, you have your diaphragm, one for your um, optical forceps. So if there's a concern because either the anesthesia team is uncomfortable, um, or the patient is difficult to put at a level of anesthesia where they can be easily ventilated. Um, they can respire readily without um, without moving. Then it's okay to paralyze. And I've done that many times. Uh, have you ever personally had a foreign body deep enough in the left or right main, main stem smaller bronchus? The traditional. Um, ENT tools were insufficient. How did you manage? Um, I have not, as an attending, had a foreign body um, that has needed to be managed with, um, with an open uh, chest procedure from a uh, pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, but I did see that um, in residency, and in that point, they were transferred to a pediatric center where there's a CT surgeon. Um, the, the good news about uh, a small, a foreign body deep enough or small enough that you can't get it with the traditional uh, bronchoscopes is that um, often those foreign bodies are not large enough and not comprom compromising enough of the pulmonary tree that the patient is in extremis. So those patients are stable. Um, either for uh, transfer to a facility where you have a pediatric pulmonologist who might be able to go into the distal sub subsegmental bron bronchus with a flexible bronchoscope and retrieve the foreign body, um, or even if you need to uh, go at your institution and have a pediatric cardiothoracic surgery, then uh, those patients with those um, foreign bodies so small or so distal uh, that you've been able to get it with the traditional tools. Um, can be transferred to a center where it can be done. Um, I think that the tenant of doing no harm um, or coming back when you can more stably and safely remove a foreign body uh, is important in those scenarios, and it's, it has to not be about ego and beating yourself up because you weren't the one that walked out of the OR with the foreign body. I think in the end, you have to think to yourself, that the better part of valor is making sure that the patient is safe. And so if you have to have the patient either somewhere else or done it another time, or done with one of your partners when they're there during the day, that's the right thing. I hope that answered the questions adequately. I don't see any other for the moment. Um, obviously happy to answer anything else you need to do. Brad, it looks like uh, there's no more uh, questions at this moment. Oh, we, we appreciate you joining us, and um, we'll we'll get that up on the um, website for the recorded videos and. Uh